Hi, good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Thanks for coming. So um, today we have a really interesting topic. And I just wanted to say that a lot of us have actually experienced burning pain from acid indigestion or reflux. And um, actually worldwide, about 60 million, especially in America, are said to be affected by um, heartburn like once, once, once a month at least. So I think it's something really topical, especially since a lot of people struggle and go to the doctors multiple times, seeking help to actually get them comfortable. And once you get this head burn, sometimes it messes up like what you're going to eat and, and therefore it makes you choose what you're eating. It makes you struggle sometimes and it's quite uncomfortable. And I think it's what remembering that if this really does affect one in a in four people in a place like the UK, it does mean that it's quite topical and it's something that a lot of us actually want to try and find a solution to it. So today we're really lucky because we're going to be joined by a brilliant surgeon who wrote this book. And I wanted to show you guys the book. It's called Why We Eat Too Much, The Science and um, the New Science of Appetite. Um, and I'm sure you're wondering, did he just write the book? No, he's also a surgeon. He's been on our webinar before. He's spoken to us about weight loss surgery and how to actually achieve lasting weight loss. He's no other person but a renowned um, laparoscopic and upper GI surgeon and also a bariatric surgeon who's actually taken a lot of years to get to where he is today. He's published over 50 research papers. He trains doctors. And he's also got a really successful private practice at Harley Street Clinic in London. He's got interest in doing weight loss surgery, diabetes, and more importantly, acid reflux disease, which is what we're going to be talking about today. He also doesn't just work in the UK. He also works in um, the UAE and other parts of the world. And more importantly, Mr. Andrew Jenkinson is it's a, it's an authority when it comes to things to do with the GI tract and also things to do with nutrition and weight loss. And we're really happy today to be introducing again, Mr. Andrew Jenkinson, as he puts us through what we can do to help ourselves with um, acid reflux. Thanks, Mr. Jenkinson. Thanks for coming. Thank you for the uh, kind introduction, Chichi. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. I'm just going to pin you to this. Thank you so much. So I know I did a bit of introdu introduction and I talked about your amazing book. I love this book a lot, right? And it's like the beam of my life at the moment. But I think that something like, it's so amazing how you do a lot of work with people, getting them to the right way that they need to get to. And more importantly, you've written a book that guides us actually about nutrition, which is a big part of what we are, because we are what we eat most times. But I just wanted to start with, um, in terms of your practice, when it comes to heartburn, right? What do people present to you with? How do they describe what they're feeling? Um, just as a sort of background, um, Dr. Chi Chi, um, yeah, so I do sort of all types of upper GI, benign upper GI surgery, so, so um, not just bariatric surgery for weight loss, but also gallstones, laparoscopic hernia repairs. But uh, many years ago, I did my thesis in um, acid reflux disease, so I've got a real ex extra specialist knowledge of, you know, foregut motility, so the motility of the esophagus stomach and going down all the way through to the duodenum um as far as sort of like um you know the symptoms that people present with there are the three primary symptoms which are you know your regular heartburn so this is a burning retrosternal sensation really uncomfortable uh, the second one is acid regurgitation so the sort of taste of acid or bile coming up into the back of your throat and the third one, interestingly, is dysphagia. So the difficulty of swallowing some foods, which is usually secondary to a degree of esophagitis. So those three, heartburn, acid regurgitation in the back of your throat, and difficulty swallowing dysphagia. Okay, okay, thank They're you. They're the main ones. Um, but a lot of referrers and doctors sort of forget the secondary um, symptoms, which can include... Um, particularly chest problems. So a lot of people who have a bad reflux get it nocturnally um, and you get reflux sort of um, finding its way into the bronchial tr tree, causing asthma, causing nocturnal coughing. So anyone who's got uh, asthma, you, know, you have to suspect, <clears throat> is it secondary to reflux? So that's something that some, some uh, people sort of um, don't really uh, grasp so much. They concentrate more on the heartburn, but it can be it can be um, 
uh, asthma as well. And obviously people who have got really severe uh, reflux will get things like dental uh, uh, problems, uh, erosions, because the acid can be you know, quite, quite uh, damaging to the enamel. Okay, and I was going to ask a question because you use the words like heartburn, reflux. Are they interchangeable or are they different? Because a lot of people go like, "Oh, they've told me I've got reflux, right?" And then some people say, "I've got a heartburn." Is is it the same thing or is interchangeable? Because heartburn is a symptom. Um, so someone can say, "I've got heartburn." That doesn't mean that the heartburn or that symptom that they're describing, retrosternal, you know, burning discomfort, is due to acid reflux. Um, it could be due to something else. It could be due to, I don't know, cardiac issues or whatever. Um, so the term gastroesophageal reflux disease um, is that the term of the actual condition that's been diagnosed by endoscopy with maybe esophagitis or with the pH manometry or with the barium swallow. So if you've got objective evidence that their symptoms are actually definitely due to reflux, then you can say they have gastroesophageal reflux disease. In England, it's uh, G-O-R-D, because we spell esophagus with an O, but in the rest of the world, it's GERD, G-E-R-D. Um, so that's the sort of differential. Some people will say I've got reflux, but that doesn't mean particularly that they've been diagnosed with gastroesophageal reflux disease. Everyone has reflux now and again. That's normal path, it's normal sort of physiological, you know, maybe a handful of times a year. Okay. And... Um... I was going to ask something. You said that people like have reflux once in a while and it could be absolutely nothing, right? I'm just wondering, like, at what point do you think people can differentiate between just having like one off reflux to actually having chronic like um, reflux where, or acid reflux, where they're able to say, listen, it's just I've got a bit of a um, heartburn. I don't really, really need to worry about it. And I've got, it's been going on for how long? Is there like a timeline people should be looking at to be able to decide when they actually seek medical help? Um, I think like most conditions, it's a spectrum from some people who hardly ever experience it ever. Um, some people a handful of times a year. Um, I fortunately fall into that uh, category. It's, it, it is pretty unpleasant when you do get it. Right. But then when it starts to become more regular, maybe every week or a few times a week, um, and really starts to affect your life, then that's when you would think, well, hang on, I'm going to maybe go down to the pharmacy or go and see my doctor and just see, you know, is there anything I can do about this? Okay. And then I was going to say, is there anything that we do like within our lives, our lifestyle, how we live our lives that could be a cause of this heartburn and predisposes one person more than the next person? Yeah, so when you, when you look at uh, treatment for reflux, it, it falls into... Uh, first looking at conservative measures, so lifestyle measures that can be changed. Then the next step is pharmacotherapy. We're talking about antacids and uh, proton pump inhibitors, H2 antagonists, which we'll talk about, I'm sure, in, in a okay. few minutes. Okay. And then the third step is uh, anti-reflux surgery. So the first thing you would always look at is, is there anything that is really sort of predisposing this patient in their lifestyle to reflux? And these things would include um, coffee, Lots of coffee, too much coffee, too much tea, too much chocolate, uh, spicy food, alcohol, smoking. All of these things are lifestyle sort of measures um, that you know predispose people to, to get reflux worsening. So sometimes it's actually just okay for them to you know change those lifestyle measures and that will you know um, solve the problem for them. For instance, if they're just drinking far too many cups of coffee uh, and they're experiencing lots of reflux. Cut, cut the coffee out. Um, if they're smoking too much or drinking too much alcohol, cut those out and see if that actually cures the problem. Okay. That would be the first sort of step. So again, chocolates, coffee, cho um, alcohol, things that people like, again, is a no-no. Like, because Spicy food, yeah. Um, yeah, spicy all, the, food. all the good things. Yeah. All the good things. So if you're just joining us, we're talking about heartburn and um, acid reflux. And Mr. Jenkinson's is here with us and speaking about this. And please, if you have questions, as always, please put it in the chat box and we'll try and get to it at some point. Yeah. So I was going to go to the next question, which is we already talked about the fact that there's stuff in the lifestyle that we can stop. So things like don't drink too much coffee, don't eat too much chocolates, don't eat too much spicy, nice food. I must add that one. What else again is there? Like, is there things to like a lot of people talk about body habitus, right? In terms of whether does that predispose people really to like to heartburn? Yeah, I think the uh, 
the higher your body mass index, the more likely you are to uh, develop uh, reflux symptoms. Uh, interestingly, you know, obviously I'm a bariatric surgeon, so when I put my laparoscope in and take a look at people's, you know, that junction between the esophagus and the, and the top of the stomach, they always have this, uh, what we call the fat pad. So this is almost like a lipoma that sort of spans that area between the esophagus and the stomach anteriorly. If you put on a lot of weight, actually that sort of fat pad, almost like a big lipoma, a big bit of, bit of fat, I think stretches the, the esophagus uh, or stretches the hiatus. And I think that might be the, you know, the contributor that causes uh, reflux in, in obese people. But obviously once it's stretched, even if they lose weight, um, it's still going to remain stretched and it will sort of become a hiatus hernia. Okay. And okay. Yes. I know we're going to talk about surgery later. So I'm going to bring that back when we talk about that to see how you help them. So you're saying you put on extra weights, you will, you might get reflux. And then once you've taken that weight off to get it back on might not really work because you're already stressed, isn't it? That's what you're trying, what you're saying. Yeah. From that sort of that particular perspective of um, maybe stretching the height or um, sort of uh, defect, um, but if you lose weight, the pressure dynamics improve. So obviously a lot of people who are carrying too much, you know, visceral fat, so abdominal fat, are going to have higher intra-abdominal pressures, uh, and that's going to sort of press and cause reflux more likely to come up. Got to bear in mind that, you know, every time we breathe in, our lungs are like a bellows. So we, when we breathe in, we're causing negative pressure, which actually just forces the air in, but also it can force acid upwards so we, we, the pressure dynamics are very interesting so if you've got a high dysonia you know every time you breathe in you're almost trying to suck the stomach and the acid up through that hiatus i think when i listen to it i'm just hearing the same things that we talk about weight weight your weight has to be right you've got to eat the right food right and you've got to like live a good lifestyle and i think like if you're just joining us we've got andrew jenkinson and he's the author of this amazing sunday bestseller that it's called why we eat too much and literally, he's not just a surgeon that does upper GI surgery. He does, obviously, refluxes that what you did your thesis on, as you told us, with um, acid burn, as um, had burns and stuff. And you're just amazing what you do with, like, the upper GI. And it's so nice to have you here again. And I was going to ask you. a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I know, like, it's been a hectic day today. So it's so amazing that you've been able to join us still. Yeah. I was going to ask about, we talked about lifestyle and things we need to do about cutting down coffee, thinking about not eating too much chocolate, so actually cutting that down, and then how weight loss eventually might help or there might be other adjuncts that need to be added. But I just wanted us to talk a little bit about one medication. So let's say they've tried all these things. It hasn't worked. What's the next step? So just going back to the sort of conservative measures. So obviously identifying and trying to cut out those um, you know, precipitants uh, in your food and sort of beverages and smoking, whatever, that actually relax the lower esophageal sphincter a little bit too much. Um, but also you can do things like, for instance, if you're getting a lot of reflux at night, you can prop up the bed so it's like a, a bit of an angle. Um, you don't want to prop it up too much because you're going to slip out of bed, but uh, you can prop it up by about 10, 15 degrees. That can sometimes, you know, help. Or maybe, you know, laying on two or three three or four pillows, so just propping yourself up a little bit. So just so the gravity is, is in your favor. Um, some people try just making sure that they don't eat for about sort of three hours before bed, uh, giving the stomach the time to totally empty so that when you do lay down, it's not still full. So there are the two other sort of lifestyle, you know, measures without medication um, that you can do apart from giving up all of those sort of um, things that we love. Um, then getting onto the medication, um, obviously you've got the antacids like Gaviscon, um, which just work really in a very, very chemical way. You know, acid is acid and they are, are alkalized, so they just sort of um, neutralize things and uh, ease the, the, the heartburn. Um, a lot of people, you know, drink who've got bad reflux will have a bottle of Gaviscon, which they literally will swig from the bottle um throughout the night when it's bad then we get on to the more powerful uh pharmacotherapy medical medical therapy the old-fashioned drugs the h2 agonists were sort of okay um they've sort of gone a little bit out of fashion now because we've got the proton pump inhibitors which you know are really quite powerful they totally negate um the the, the acid secretion um in the stomach and you know usually will improve improve the problem maybe make the problem go away 
Um, the interesting thing about the proton pump inhibitors, um, and these are drugs like ametprazole, lanzoprazole, rubiprazole, pantoprazole, all the drugs with azole at the end, um, is they they can be titrated up. So you can you can start off at a relatively low dose, maybe if you're talking about ametprazole, 20 milligrams or 40 milligrams, but they can be titrated up. You've got to bear in mind that they only last um, or they only suppress acid for 18 hours. So a lot of people are just on them once a day, uh, but they get, for instance, if they have them in the morning, they'll get, they'll wake up with reflux. So this is where you've got to consider, you know, you know a BD twice a day medication. Okay. So okay. Um, I prefer people to be on a split dose 12, 12 hours apart, otherwise they're going to get that window of six hours where, you know, the acid suppression isn't so good. And you can increase, I mean, people can be on, you know, um, 80 milligrams of a metrazole twice a day. Um, and that works. So I was going to say, like, you know, you talked about people that sometimes just drown themselves in Gaviscon and the chalky Gaviscon and different things. Are there like any side effects for taking that much of Gaviscon or when we talk about things like Gaviscon? Um, I don't think so. I mean, they're pretty simple, just alkali liquids. I don't think, you know, apart from the fact that they don't, they don't really particularly work, there's very, very short term measures to alleviate symptoms, I think. Mm. Um, but I, you know, I don't think there's any severe uh, long term problems with taking lots of antacids. Mm -hmm. And um, so what I, sometimes we get requests, like even from patients generally that I see, like pre-op, they say like, they've tried them, they've tried the Gaviscon, it hasn't really worked. They've tried the um, the proton pump inhibitors and it hasn't really worked. Is there a timeline you think that if they've tried it up to, and they're really still getting bad reflux that they should then seek like more um, definitive treatments or I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people who come to me, um, they say that the uh, proton pump inhibitors don't work, but actually quite often they just haven't, you know, titrated the dose up properly. So, you know, they may be on 20 or 40 milligrams once a day, but if you get them up to 40 milligrams twice a day, you know, it might be that their life is bearable again and their symptoms are controlled. Um, so, yeah. Um, but then people fall into the category of um, some people don't want to take BPIs for years on end because obviously it doesn't get rid of the problem. And as soon as you forget them, your condition will come back, you know, within hours. Um, so there's the category of people who don't really want to take, you know, long, long-term PPIs. And then there's also the category of people that despite being on really high doses still get refractory symptoms, breakthrough symptoms. So both of that group of, of people would then, there be the people that you sort of discuss the surgery with. Obviously, you've got to look all the way back through the through the um, investigation and make sure that they, they do have objective, proper, you know, mm -hmm. uh, evidence of reflux from investigations, esophagitis or you know, serious reflux on barium, or you know, the gold standard would be the the, the pH manometry, twenty four hour pH measurement. So I was going to ask, right? We all know about like um how obviously when you've been baited in like acid for a long time, you can get complications. And I think what comes into my mind easily are things like you know the acid constantly erodes and erodes and erodes, and at some point you get like scarring, and then the esophagus gets really small. Are there other complications that are obviously more um dangerous, or is it dangerous as well? That is more impactive than just things like scarring or narrowing of the esophagus that we should think about while we've been exposed to acid for such so, for such a long time. Yeah, I mean, um, scarring and uh, almost like chronic, very very severe reflux causing scarring and stenosis of the esophagus would be pretty pretty rare these days with with proton pump inhibitors. Mm -hmm. um, and ulceration of the esophagus, obviously, the very, very severe, you know, uh, reflux. Um, if you sort of look at that category of really, really chronic reflux, um, then obviously you then can start talking about Barrett's uh, dysplasia. So this is, mm -hmm. you know, uh, dysplastic changes in the lower esophageal mucosa that uh, are, you know, potentially precancerous. Um, they start off, you know, obviously as a, as a metaplasia. But then they go to different levels of dysplasia, uh, where their, their potential risk of cancer is um, increased. So they then need you know proper surveillance. And you know if you get severe dysplasia, that's almost like carcinoma in situ. So you do need to go to a proper cancer surgeon for that uh, to discuss you know, 
proper you know, maybe even mm -hmm. sort of joke to me. I think grade one, if you have uh, metaplasia or grade one uh, uh, Barrett's, then probably you want to have a, an anti reflux, consider an anti reflux surgery because I think it's there's good evidence that it stops the progression of Barrett's. Sometimes it doesn't reverse it, but it's going to stop it progressing to you know, severe dysplasia. Okay. So what I was going to ask, like, obviously, we know that the long term effect is that people can end up below Barrett's, which is a precancerous, and then possibility of having like cosmetic cancer which is obviously like life-changing and literally difficult what are the surgical options when people have tried like um they've tried um to do like lifestyle modification doesn't work they've tried um things like gaviscon doesn't work they do ppis doesn't work and they're constantly struggling and you know obviously they don't that means that um, acid reflux is not getting better and the acid production and the problems it's causing is ongoing what are the other options that people can have in terms of surgery to try and reduce the effect, I guess, or just stop the whole disease? Yeah. So, I mean, the mainstream options are, are anti-reflux surgery. So this would be something called a uh, Nissen fund application, uh, which is sort of one of the mainstays of my practice. Um, increasingly, a lot of people, as we sort of uh, alluded to earlier, Chi Chi, um, suffer with both bad reflux but also obesity now for these patients you know that they come to me I, it's my job to say well hang on we could do anti-reflux surgery but actually a better operation for you would be stop the glow on why gastric your bypass is going to totally negate and uh, reverse your reflux but also you're going to lose 30 40 percent of your weight so maybe if you're type 2 diabetic that's going to go so that would be the mainstream sort of two surgical treatments so laparoscopic Nissen fundification, so standard anti reflux surgery. And then, if they've got, if they're suffering with obesity as well, discuss the lap, realm, I guess, you bypass. I just want to throw in this sort of new uh, procedure that some surgeons and gastroenterologists are pushing called the Lynx device. Have you heard about that? Yes, I've heard about that. And it'll be nice. I was going to ask you that question, actually. Yeah. Yeah. The Lynx is a, uh, a basically, it's a little bit like a child, children's uh, little plastic bracelets with all the beads on mm -hmm. but they're, they're magnetic beads um, and the links is something where um, this sort of chain or you know a necklace of magnetic beads is fitted around the lower esophagus just where the lower esophageal sphincter is and it's supposed to create a sort of you know, a low grade tone to, to buttress or you know keep the, the, the um, esophagus closed when you swallow or you know when you swallow a bolus of food because the pressure just increases the it breaks the uh the magnetic chain and the bolus of food will go through and conceptually it's really good concept <clears throat> yes. the problem is i mean there's a reason that it's not become popularized and that's Popular, because exactly yeah. it, pro it probably doesn't work very well um a lot of people you know get dysphagia um, is too tight for them <clears throat> we know that any foreign body is going to get encapsulated by by um, the body so so scar tissue forms sort of around all of the little balls and then they can't relax or, or nothing can happen they can't move anymore uh, so a lot of these I think you know probably you know are removed mm -hmm. it's one of those procedures where you know there was initial you know uh, enthusiasm for it by you know these pioneer surgeons who always want to do something new and you get like the early studies that are published so you know usually sponsored by industry that you know show great results but then you know there is never with these new devices a a time where you know bad results are published because people don't publish their bad results they bury yeah. them you know um yeah, well, sure happening. there's a lot of these that have come out you know the problem is that you know if you get an encapsulated band around the lower esophagus that's like really like quite complicated and potentially you know disastrous surgery if you get a hole in the esophagus so i would i'm very anti the lynx device i think there's a lot of it on but i don't think a lot of people have actually taken it on because it hasn't really like taken up properly yeah i'm think, very yeah. cynical about any surgeon putting them in i think they may have integrity problems or maybe they just don't understand what they're doing what so they're either doing. way it's not good because mm. I think the problem is that you know a lot of people like something new comes out is not really being tested properly and some new like de novo people with little experience just go out ahead and just 
go mad and just put it on so many people and then 10 years down the line we have really lot bad complications and then you have to sort them out because you know what i mean is yeah. i like literally like that just like that so i think it's always nice when like i speak to someone like you because i know you've got the years of experience you've seen all these things you know what works and what doesn't work and then that way people are able to actually make informed decision by what they think they need to do to help them in this situation mm -hmm. so i was just wondering whether you could cast a little bit um, um more light on what the surgery actually involves um the surgery that the, you for the standard sort of anti-reflex surgery, yeah, anti surgery. Yeah, um, it's nice for people to understand what that involves so i think a lot of people mm -hmm. struggle with happen and when i've seen a lot of effects of happen down the line and it's horrible when people come out with like you know those facial cancer it's difficult to treat the tissue is really friable and literally yeah. it's end of the line if that makes Know, yeah, so you want to get to people, you know, before they get Barrett's or Barrett's exactly you know, Barrett's progression, or, or you know that those people who just don't don't want to be on PPIs long term, or you know they're still getting uh, symptoms coming through despite high doses of PPIs. Yeah. So the standard anti-reflux operation is called the fundoplication. Yeah. Um, there's a particular type that I do called the Nissan fundoplication, which yeah. is basically a, what we call a 360 degree wrap. Um, the surgery is pretty straightforward uh, for me. Um, four or five small little cuts up at abdomen, just about between five and 10 millimeters across. Um, it takes less than one hour. And what we do is we um, first dissect the whole of the, uh, the hiatus. So where the esophagus comes through, you can imagine the esophagus is a, a tube. It's coming through the whole of the esophagus. We dissect that whole area out so we can see the hiatus and we can see the esophagus coming through it and we can see the stomach um and usually you know you can see um you know if it's a really wide uh, hiatus you can see the stomach going all the way up so you have to like you know, dissect it all the way back down you can see everything very very clearly the crora and everything like that you then would you know want to free up the whole of the fundus of the stomach so the greater curvature in the fundus of the stomach that's the bit of the stomach that you're going to mobilize to make it really free and floppy and then you bring it around the esophagus and you basically stitch it back on itself so you, you buttress the, the the esophagus with this wrap of the fundus um and in addition you put probably two or three sutures into the the, the crora to just tighten tighten the crora the the uh the soft gel hiatus itself so the main you know the main parts of the operation are those stitches in the crora and the 360 degree you know mobilization uh, uh, fundification so wrapping that fundus floppy part of the stomach around the lower esophagus and then that way it stops it you know because it's quite a big bit of tissue then it stops the, the, the esophagus the stomach going back up through the hiatus mm -hmm. okay. that was interesting thank you so much about that so if you're just joining we're talking about heartburn and if you have questions please put it in the chat box we've got mr jenkinson's here with us he's like a renowned upper gi surgeon that does a lot of work with not just bariatric surgery and upper gi surgery but also with gallstones and also obviously we're talking about reflux and he's got a t he's done a thesis and a lot of work on reflux surgery so mr jenkins i was going to ask you one more question right you said about the surgery just being for one hour do people go home the same day or are they in hospital for a couple of days how does it work no there's a risk there's a very small risk of bleeding because we um so we dissect the fundus of the stomach from the uh from this the, 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 its attachments including the short gastric blood vessels which come from the spleen to the stomach and you know those vessels can be quite big so there is a, a extremely small chance but there is a chance that they can start to bleed within 24 hours you've got to keep them in hospital really um because if you go home you can fill up your peritoneum with three three and a half liters of blood um that's your almost your blood volume so um you're going to be pretty sick whereas if you're on a ward getting observations overnight you know there's no, the nurse will call the surgeon and you know you can deal with it mm -hmm. some units would send people home um as a day case but i don't think it's uh, advisable okay and immediately post up do they go on like a liquid diet or do they are they able to eat normally or so my patients tend to so i don't have a protocol in saying you've got to be on a liquid diet for a week um for, for the foundation operation i mm -hmm. say you know uh Sloppy, sloppy uh, diet, consistency food, stroke, mashed or soft foods. Um, what I do tell them is that, you know, it is going to be tighter. 
they're not going to be able to eat you know particularly viscous or or, or um, sticky foods so things like bread uh, meats chicken uh, lamb beef um, what were we talking about Gary Gary <laughs> Uh, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, for how long? That's not fair. Yeah, so nobody <laughs> gets stuck. Is that out of the way. People actually lose, you know, uh, on average three or four kilograms after this operation oh. because the stomach, the part of the stomach that you wrap around, uh, means that the stomach size goes down a little bit. So um, they can't eat as much. Uh, obviously, they're on this sort of soft diet for a while. So yeah, people tend to lose a little bit of weight, which they like. It's like two for the price of one, isn't it? <laughs> it is, yeah. Well, you've got to say to the people. So nice, yeah. People have got to have like significant symptoms beforehand um, because the operation itself can cause problems or certainly in, 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 in the initial period. So it can cause dysphagia, uh, obviously. So you can't have a chicken burger for, the, for a, a couple of months. Yeah. Um, it can also cause some bloating. So it's m much more difficult to burp uh, or erectate um, after uh, a fundification. So some people then get, you know, obviously every time we swallow, we swallow air. And then you know, normally we subconsciously just belch that back out. But if you can't do that, you'll get much more bloated and uh, that can be, um, you know, quite uncomfortable. Some people will pass more flatus. Um, but all of these things almost always settle down within, you know, three, four, six months. And then long term, what what is the long term effect of you? Obviously, it's supposed to, their reflux will go away, I assume, and then they'll lose a little bit of weight. And are there any long term like what do people expect long term after the surgery? So I mean, there's no guarantee. Um, the longer you go along, uh, the more likely it is that reflux may come back. Okay, you may need uh, some PPIs again, um, but it, I think it's a pretty good intervention. It's, it's okay. especially the 360 degree Nissan fundification that I do. Uh, I think it's pretty durable. Um, so I don't get a whole load of patients coming back needing more, more, more okay. doing. Okay. <clears throat> I was going to take a question, if that's okay, because the questions are beginning to trickle in, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the first person says, um, weight loss and maintaining the loss for menopausal women seems difficult. Mm -hmm. What can be done to assist in this situation? But sorry, weight loss. In... Weight loss and maintaining the loss for menopausal women seems difficult. Yeah. What can be done to assist the situation? So, I mean, we sort of discussed this a little bit last time. This is about sort of weight regulation and the fact that most people who go on diets can lose the weight, but they can't maintain the weight loss and the weight goes back up. Mm -hmm. And that's because of this you know, theory called the weight set point theory, which I think sort of really explains weight regulation and the difficulties of dieters. So... For instance, if you're um, 100 kilograms and you want to get down to you know, 90 or 80 kilograms and you go on a low calorie diet, um, your body will want to, your body thinks 100 kilograms is normally your brain, your hypothalamus, and it's going to fight against, you know, losing that weight. And it has a couple of, you know, things in its armamentarium. The main thing is its metabolism. So metabolism can really shrink, your basal metabolism can really shrink. Um, you know, by six, seven hundred kilocalories a day, which is a lot. It's the same as a 10K run <clears throat> or a three course meal. So that's the first thing that happens. You, you, you go, OK, maybe I was on 1800 calories before. I'm going to go down to 1200, maybe 1000 calories. At first, you're going to lose weight, but the body's metabolism is going to adapt to the calorie restriction. In addition, you get very high levels of appetite hormones. So you're feeling extremely hungry. Mm -hmm. So you get to a situation, you know, two, three, four, five weeks into a diet where you have lost, you know, five, 10 kilograms, but you continue the diet, you're getting more and more fatigued because your metabolism is down and you're getting more hungry and irritable because your, you know, your hunger hormones are very high. And the scales are not shifting anymore. Uh, and this is the frustration of dieting is that, you know, you, you may win the battle at first, but you know, the second, the war is always won by, by the body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so what you've got to do is you've got to understand why your weight is set to 100 kilograms, for instance. And it's all to do with not the calories, but the type of food that you eat and what it does to your body. So, for instance, if you consume a lot of you know, refined carbohydrates and sugar and vegetable oils, all of these things significantly affect insulin signaling and insulin blocks 
leptin, which is the, you know, the mass to control the hormonally of your, your weight. So leptin is a thing that comes from your fat. If you've got too much fat, the brain should be able to see that and, you know, calm down your eating and increase your metabolism. But insulin blocks the leptin signal, which means, you know, the brain gets confused. It doesn't realize that you're you're far too big you know you're carrying six months worth of energy on board rather than the, the two months that is normally needed mm. so if you understand that then you can sort of cut down those uh those carbohydrates and sugars and snacking if you can sort of form uh, a, a new sort of lifestyle and eating culture where you're really just eating much more natural fresh old-fashioned foods meat fish vegetables a little bit of dairy product not snacking between meals, then you're going to reduce your weight set point, um, maybe to 90. And this is much more sustainable if you can, you know, really, really sort of like change those habits. I think like at the end of the day, like a lot of those things actually related in, to our weight, isn't it? Because we talked about the fact that if people are overweight and they've got like stretching of their muscles, then even if they lose the weight and they have that pulse still, there's still a problem. And then I get, I think that gets us to the next question. Someone says, um, I'm overweight and I also have acid reflux, right? And I know you talked about maybe doing the weight loss surgery first. If I did do the weight loss surgery, would that help my acid reflux or? Yes, yeah, so as we said before, so, um, a perfect operation for reflux is the gastric bypass, the real my gastric bypass, not the mini gastric bypass, which makes reflux worse, mm -hmm. but the real my where, you know, the stomach is totally bypassed. Um, so no acid secretions can get near uh, the esophagus for well, minimal anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an operation if you're, you know, suffering with, both with obesity and se severe reflux, it's going to get rid of the reflux. If a patient comes to me looking for bariatric surgery uh, and we start to discuss the various different options, but they say, oh, by the way, I've got really bad reflux, then it's almost like a no-brainer. You're going to say, hang on, you need a real my gastric you bypass. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the next question is, um, I don't really feel heartburn, but I have a bitter taste constantly in my mouth. Is this also reflux? Yeah, I think that's um, acid regurgitation. That's uh, something that, you know, it doesn't always cause heartburn, um, the, the acid. In some people, they can get really bad, you know, acid levels, but they don't feel it. Um, and yeah, it doesn't cause esophagitis, um, but it can cause this like taste in the back of your mouth, a bitter taste. Constantly, okay. And um, just um, just if you're just joining now, um, we're talking about acid reflux and heartburns. And if you have any questions, please put it in the chat box. So I was going to ask, I know we talked about the surgical options, right? And we talked about fund application being um, the ultimate surgical option. How many cases of them do you find? I know you said you don't really have a lot of people returning, but in terms of like the data that exists, are there people that come back again, maybe because the um, it's failed? And what are those percentages? And um, Maybe about 10% of people in 10, 15 years may come back. Um, but you'd be pretty reluctant to reoperate on them. Um, That's awesome. Fund application. I mean, what you might want to do, uh, and I've done this uh, quite a few times, is convert the fund application then into a gastric bypass, even if they're not particularly obese, because you know it's not going to cause any more weight loss if they're not obese, but it is going to you know, totally negate the, the the chance of any reflux occurring. Whereas if you do revision fund application and like for another hydrocele repair. Um, the more operations, revision operations you do, the, the less successful they are and the more dangerous they are. So that balance of risk and benefit is, um, is sort of shifted away from um, it, further surgery being good. Okay, thank you so much. And there's a question that says, um, is there an, I'm not, I'm sorry, is there a structural reason why people could get chronic reflux not related to their body weights is there a structural reason yeah so this is what we can talk about hiatus hernia so this like increased um basically caliber of the hole in the in the diaphragm which you know should just be about that big it should let the esophagus through but in some people it just increases and increases and increases so you've actually then got quite a big hole in the diaphragm and the stomach will come up into the chest particularly every time you lay down or breathe in and so that is a structural abnormality it's much more likely that you're going to get better after an operation uh, with that. 
Okay, and for people that you see with higher testosterone, what is do they just come in with heartburn or they come in with more severe symptoms? Um, yeah, if the high testosterone is massive, and some people can have most of their stomachs in their chest, then they can get you know really quite unwell. Um, they can get the gastric bolus and need an emergency operation, otherwise the stomachs kind of become necrotic. Um, it's much more unusual, but you know, particularly in you know elderly kyphotic uh, women, uh, it can occur. You can get really big, um, massive hiatus hernia, okay. which can be quite a complex operation, but you know, it's something that you need to do because yeah, you can't really live a, a nice life with your stomach in your chest. Okay. And um, so you do like, what type of options do they have for this hiatus hernia surgery normally? So, I mean, that's just, you know, you do the dissection, you bring the stomach back into the abdomen, uh, you can either just put some stitches in the hiatus or more uh, effective is to put some stitches in the hiatus and then do a fundification. So wrap that floppy uh, part of the fundus of the stomach up all the way around the, the lower esophagus to stop it sort of going back up okay. into the chest. Okay, someone else has written, can you explain um, in more details what bowel reflux means and how that is different from acid reflux? Um, yeah, so some people will be refractory to proton pump inhibitors because they get bile reflux. Um, so that tends to mean that, you know, everyone was, everyone's going to get, when you do a gastroscopy, you always see a little bit of bile that's coming back, you know, through the uh, pylorus. But some people have got real problems with um, gastroduodenal motility and they get a lot of bile coming back into the stomach. Um, and that, in those circumstances, you know, despite PPIs, you've got a lot of bile in the stomach, um, you're going to get bile reflux. So the only investigation, you know, to specifically look for that would be the Bravo uh, capsule, uh, which looks, you know, uh, for, 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 for bile reflux as well. Um, but you can sort of get a hint of it. I mean, if someone's got esophagitis, but they're on a lot of PPIs, maybe it is the bile that's causing that. And bile is much more, even more erosive than uh, acid. Acid. Okay, thank you. And um, the next question says, are there any genetic or hereditary factors that predispose people to develop chronic heartburn and reflux? Yeah, I think it does run in the family. I don't know, the, in families, I don't know the figures, but yeah, if you've got, uh, you know, a relative who's got it, it's more likely that you will, you will suffer with it. Okay, so like, um, so I think, I guess the question to that is that, so if you had people that were, um, um, that in the family that had, um, had burn, is there something you do like to be able to find out whether you're predisposed to it or not really, you just wait for it to start? Yeah, you wouldn't investigate unless you actually start to get symptoms. Yeah, yeah. There's, no, there's no point in investigating. Mm -hmm. And then someone else has written, um, I've got acid reflux and for a long time, I've literally just taken, um, Gaviscon, what investigations, I think they must have missed while we talked about, what investigations should they get ideally to start out? Um, I mean, the first investigation can be like a treatment as well. So if you've got reflux symptoms um, and you want to know whether those symptoms are due to the actual, you know, due to acid coming up, you can take a PPI, negate or, you know, um, stop the acid forming in the stomach and if you get suddenly better then it's most likely that you know re your reflux is caused by acid um and you know similarly some people will be on ppis and you know they're you know they're to the they can't come off them they're, 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 if they come off them they're going to get really bad symptoms in a way you know that's a form of you know quite positive uh evidence that the the, the symptoms are caused by reflux but if you're going to look into investigations then obviously the, the mainstay is going to be uh, uh esophageal manometry uh to see if they've got a higher tisania or a weak lower esophageal mm -hmm. sphincter to see if the esophagus is working properly and then put a ph probe down there to see how much acid is coming up over a 24-hour period okay, thank you so much so if you're just joining us, we're talking about heartburn with Mr. Jenkinson. And if you have questions, please put it in the chat box. I think I have a few more questions to go through. We're just trying to put it in the chat box so we can address it and try and help. The next person says, if you've already developed Barrett's esophagus, right? Um, mm -hmm. 
And if you, if you had um, reflux surgery, would that reverse the Barrett's? Uh, as we said before, um, it's, I think there's evidence that it halts the progression of it. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if there's evidence that it reverses it. Uh, most people with Barrett's, it's just Barrett's metaplasia. So it's just the changes. They're not uh, precancerous changes. So um, you know, the presence of Barrett's is uh, not always the worst thing in the world. Also, you know, people got to be aware that it's, you know, if you, sometimes it's a little bit subjective between endoscopists. So some endoscopists will say, oh yeah, that's a little bit of Barrett's. And some people will say that's the normal Z line between the esophageal and the uh, gastric mucosa so it's a little bit objective you know some a, a, in a very cynical perspective some gastroenterologists you know they have Barrett's registries where they get patients coming back you know every <laughs> two years for their, their endoscopy and they've got hundreds of patients on there so it's in their interest to 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 uh like the data knows it you know um but it is a little bit if it's short segment Barrett's which is less than two centimeters you know it's all about you know the folds as the as the you know as you put the endoscope sort of through down into the into the um, lower esophageal sphincter. It's a little bit like when you fold up your finger. You can see those those folds there. Um, that's you know if the mucosa comes beyond one of those folds, then it's supposed to be Barrett. So it's a little bit subjective to be honest. Okay. But obviously, if you've got long segment Barrett's, if it's coming up over two centimeters, then yeah, it's definitely Barrett's. It's definitely right. And I think the next person is talking, I think, uh, about Barrett's and saying, if, um, if no, sorry, not Barrett's, they've said, if um, if I've got reflux, should I be doing regular endoscopies or something to make sure I don't develop Barrett's? Um, no, if you've had an endoscopy and you don't have Barrett's, then you don't need to keep on having endoscopies. Even if there's reflux, right? Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. I mean, if you've got esophagitis, <clears throat> then, then a doctor will treat you and he may want to know whether you've responded to the treatment by doing another endoscopy to see if the esophagitis gets better okay this is i think this is a medical question right okay. this guy, how do the lower esophageal sphincter sphinx, function in individuals with GERD and what factors can weaken its effectiveness i think this is a doctor asking the question yeah um so the sort of um The regular way, the regular doctors think that, you know, it's people with gastroesophageal reflux disease are going to have a low um, pressure, lower esophageal sphincter all the time. Mm. Actually, if you look at the evidence, reflux, um, two thirds of reflux is caused by, you know, what we call transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation, which is basically the belch reflux. So if people who are air swallowers, the fundus of the stomach gets distended with air. That triggers what we call lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. So lower, lower esophageal sphincter relaxes in order for you to belch air, but also acid up. Um, so that's something that it won't particularly be seen on a manometry, uh, but does account for about two thirds of ref pathological reflux. The only way you can really, uh, you know, uh, diagnose transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation is, uh, is basically an experimental test. It's something called the dense sleeve uh, where they just they look at the reflux over a 24 hour period but you know you're better off just looking for the amount of acid coming into the esophagus um, you know if you do a fundoplication on someone you're sort of close you're, you're 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 wrapping the, the the fundus of the stomach around the esophagus that actually has the effect of stopping the fundus you know dilating up with gas uh, and preventing transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation so uh, in a way, the fundification works not just by buttressing, but by actually stop, stopping that uh, relaxation reflux. Okay, thank you. Someone says, I've been I've been told I've got small hiatus <laughs> hernia. Um, and however, I get really severe symptoms from the um from the from the reflux. Should I be getting surgery if I've tried all the medical treatments and it hasn't worked? So, so the question is, they've been told they have a small hiatus hernia. A small hiatus hernia, yeah. Okay, which is quite common. But then they have bad symptoms that are not yeah. cured by... By, uh, by the medications. Okay. So you would then say, well, have you titrated... First, are you on PPIs rather than H2 antagonists or, or, or antacids? 
And then have you titrated the PPI up enough? And if you have, if you're on quite a high dose, then yeah, there's nothing else you can do. You're refractory to PPIs. Um, you've got a latest discern, yeah, you should probably seek uh, a referral to have a chat with a surgeon about the pros and cons of, of the operation. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, the next question talks about how many people in your practice do you see that have had chronic reflux that have developed esophageal cancer? Um, none. None. Okay. No. <laughs> By the time they Press come, because it's something that when you're told you have it, um, you go on Google and you really get scared. But actually, I think there is quite a lot of evidence that you're much more likely um, to die from something else, embarrass yourself, some, even if you've got low grade dysplasia. Um, the worry would be, you know, those very, very rare people who've got high grade dysplasia secondary to the Barrett's, which mm -hmm. can be, you know, constituted by esophageal surgeons as, you know, carcinoma in situ. So uh, you've got the carcinoma, but it's not actually been shown on the biopsies yet. In which case, probably, you know, um, you would need to go and see a proper esophageal cancer surgeon who would probably, um, you know, think about a resection. Although, you mean, there are newer endoscopic, you know, ablations of, of uh, Barrett's that, you know, can be offered uh, at, at varying degrees of success. Thanks. Um, someone else has said, um, at what, how many years, do you have a timeline for when people should really seek surgery if they've suffered it all their life? I'm not sure what that means. Maybe their adult life, they mean. Uh, not really. I mean, if um, the, the problem with chronic disease is you get used to it. So your quality of life goes down and you just think that's normal. Um, so you need to be aware, you know, that uh, you don't have to live with really bad heartburn on a daily basis. Um, and sometimes, you know, it takes people you know, who, who are used to being sick uh, and are a little bit scared of surgery. Um, you know, it takes them some time to, to realize that actually things in their life could be a lot better. Mm -hmm. And then I think that's one, we're going to take maybe two more. So um, what is the role of gastric balloon for reflux and weight loss, I think? The gastric balloon is a, a terrible intervention that causes reflux. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a, a balloon, by well, the various different uh, uh, manufacturers, different different sizes and things, but it tends to be you know, about that big, uh, sitting in your stomach like a brick, um, very uncomfortable, causes like a lot of gastric uh, uh, spasm. 20% um, of people who have a gastric balloon can't tolerate them uh, and they need to come out within two weeks and they wasted their whatever, 4,000, uh, 4,500 US dollars. Um, the people who can tolerate them, a lot of them get reflux. Um, the balloons can only be in for around six months. They tend to lose around about 10 kilograms on average, but as soon as you remove the balloon, the weight goes back on. So I think they are a completely ineffective intervention. Um, I've never seen anyone whose life has been changed around by a gastric balloon, but I've seen a lot of people, many people who've you know lost a lot of money to doctors putting them in. Thank you so much. And someone else has asked, um, does red meat and red wine cause heartburn? Um, red wine, yes. Any alcohol. I think red wine probably worse. So spirits and, uh, you know, darker um, alcohols um, like red wine, port and things like that. Um, steak, if it's really, really, really fatty or very peppery, then maybe, but not not particularly a lean steak. I think what we talked about already for people that are just joined, because I think people are joined at different times, is like spicy food, um, having coffee, too much coffee, drinking alcohol, and then all the almighty chocolates that we all love for some reason. Anything that's really nice always causes some problem. And obviously you also talked about, I, I, I think a lot of people have a lot of questions on weight loss, actually. But you, we talked a lot about it um, the last time on um, the secrets of last and weight loss. And what we focused on was about eating right, not eating a lot of like refined or processed food. And I think, Mr. Jenkins, if you don't mind, would you just cast a little bit of eye? Because there's a lot of questions on actually weight loss and what to eat and diet. And uh, so I, I just think maybe we'll just do a wrap up on that so that we recap what is it and things that you can offer to help them also. Well, yeah, I mean, it's not rocket science. It's not to do with calories. It's to do with what the uh, 
the food does to you metabolically. As we discussed before, you know, um, high insulin levels block the leptin signal, meaning that your body wants to gain weight because it can't see the amount of fat on you. So it's like a misfiring of your normal um, negative feedback homeostasis to control your weight. And that high insulin is basically caused by uh, eating too much sugary foods and refined carbohydrates, things with with um, uh, with wheat in basically, and snacking too much between meals, uh, which is just what the Western diet is. And also, as we sort of mentioned before, vegetable oils are very artificial types of food, and again can disrupt insulin signaling. And these thing these things, you know, sugar, refined carbohydrates. And vegetable oil just infuse the whole of the Western diet um, from fast food to processed foods on the shelves in supermarkets. Um, uh, they are they are you know addictive, make us feel really good, but they're really bad for us metabolically. Um, so you need to try and avoid those foods. I mean, we know avoiding them causes you no know, weight loss, but people think avoiding them causes weight loss because of a decrease in calories. It doesn't, it's what they the, the food does to you metabolically. So if you switch to a diet, an old fashioned diet of meat, fish, normal vegetables, um, get into cooking, you know, really enjoy your food. Um, try not to snack between meals, have two or three meals a day. Um, maybe you don't snack in the evening. So maybe try and fast for 16 hours a day and eat for eight hours. All of these things are gonna be fantastic for your, your insulin levels. Um, and you will seamlessly lose weight and keep it off. But, you know, running away from calories uh, either in the gym or through low calorie dieting yeah. is counterproductive. Thank you. So I think like that's something I learned from you that is so good. And I'm going to say, I'm going to plug this in because I think it's good people read this book, right? That Mr. Jenkins has written. It's a Sunday bestseller. It's called Why We Eat Too Much. And I think it's so good in terms of for everyone that has like questions on what we should really be eating. This is like based on science, not just based on, um, not just based on, like people sitting down thinking they know what they're talking about. You've done it for over two decades. So you're an authority in what you're speaking about, not just helping people get better in terms of their lifestyle, also offering them when they're overweight, getting them into the right weight and reversing things like diabetes, and reducing their stroke and um, their stroke um, rates and reducing things like heart attacks. And then more importantly, you do a lot of work with people that have reflux, gold stones, and you're getting giving people a better life. I think it's good to read this if you're worried about what you should be eating and what you shouldn't really be eating, because it's like properly researched and is an authority when it comes to to nutrition. And I'm going to take one more question if you don't, if you don't mind. I know you've got like you've had a busy day today in clinic all day. Okay. You're traveling soon. And I'm so sorry I'm keeping you awake tonight before you catch your flight. Okay. How can we avoid belly fats? I told you everyone's talking about weight loss. They have to read this book. You have to read this book. It's changed my life, to be honest. I mean, uh, visceral belly fat is, I was actually talking about this the other day to someone, um, a man who's got a bit of a belly. In a way, it's an evolutionary, you know, protective thing as a, as a, a male, uh, you know, human gets older, you know, if you can imagine when we were hunter gatherers, you know, maybe that who's going to lag behind in the in the in the um, you know in the hierarchy of of getting food. So you know the survival instinct, uh, even from an evolutionary perspective, is to carry a little bit more uh, insurance in the form of calories in your body. Um, so it's one of those things that you know I think is almost an evolutionary protection. But, you know, if you want to get rid of it, you've got to do what I just said before. But probably, you know, you really got to work on it and probably, you know, find time to go to the gym as well. Um, the gym, you know, again, you, you're not running the calories off to lose weight, but your um, ex vigorous exercise improves insulin function, so you don't need as much of it and reduces your cortisol level. Again, having a beneficial effect on a insulin signaling and your metabolism so yeah you just got to eat good and probably get into exercise because it is pretty difficult to shift unless you do that thank you thank you so much honestly i'm going to have to stop here because i know you need to rest today you've had like and you're catching the flight in a couple of hours so it's fantastic thanks yeah. for coming again okay. and if what well, you don't mind right i have to pack so uh, oh, yeah. Yes. yeah i know you have not packed also i feel so bad and we've taken like no, an it's hour a pleasure. Thank you so much for speaking to us. And obviously, um, if you ever think like you want to see Mr. Jenkinson, please contact us and we'll put you in touch with him. And as I said, this book needs to, is a must read if you want to like get solutions. So I want to thank you so much, honestly, like um, 
it's always nice to chat to you about, you know, weight loss, chat to you about heartburn and um, reflux and what you do surgically, because you do a lot of amazing work and a lot of people have really benefited from your services for like such a long time. Mm -hmm. And I also want to thank the London Clinic, like introducing you to me, it's been amazing. And for people that don't know, London Clinic is like one of the biggest private hospitals in London, based in Harley Street and all over, not just Harley Street. You guys have like half of Harley Street, to be honest. Yeah. And and it's amazing, like, you know, I think what's really important about this webinar is that we're getting you to speak to people that have authority, they know what they're speaking about. A lot of the things that they do, they do great work. So you expect to get the best care. And I think it's amazing them taking out their time to just come and speak to us. And I want to thank everyone that's joining. I know it's not easy to join the webinar sometimes. We've had a lot of people log in from London. We've got a lot of people from Ghana, actually, loads and loads of people from Ghana, from Nigeria, from the States and a lot, some people from the UAE also. So as usual, I always try to say goodbye to people in different places. In London, it's bright and sunny. So it's still good night from London, good night Ghana, Nigeria. And I think in America, it's like two o'clock or three o'clock at the moment. So good afternoon to them. And thanks to the animal health team, you guys set up everything and try to make everything work really well. The technical team, everyone keeps doing a lot to just make this happen. Thanks, Mr. Jenkinson. Thank you very much. I look forward to and I hope we, And I hope we can speak again by the time you get back. Thank you, Dr. Chichi. Thank, thank you so much. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye.